All right, MMA fans, the champ is here. I have the pleasure to talk with Cage Warriors lightweight title holder, Mr. George Hardwick. Hello, sir. How are you today? I'm very chilled. I'm very good today. Just lying in bed playing Doom 64 on my Switch. Oh, nice. Um, how was your morning session? So I I didn't really do much this morning. It was just, it's kind of like a strength conditioning thing. My uh, my strength and conditioning coach gives me where it's just kind of a primer where it's very low reps. There's some explosive movements, but you literally don't drop a bead of sweat, sweat throughout the whole workout. It's just kind of, you know, more like activation stuff and mobility. Tonight I'll do some floor roll and some jujitsu. Not like super heavy, just a bit of roll, a bit of drills. I mean, that's fair enough considering that we're recording this interview during uh, fight week. So, yeah, it's going to be, you know, you. I, I'm guessing that you have to, you know, to come to your fight prepared, but at the same time, uh, you know, healthy. Yeah, it's a, fight week's all about just kind of passing time and you want to open the tap a little bit, but you don't want to open it too much because... Then you start to recover and you feel fast and you feel really good and you want to blast the bag and blast the pads absolutely loads. It's just opening the tap a little bit and then turn it back. Do you have any particular rituals during uh, fight weeks? Is there anything in particular you like to, to do? I don't know, ahead of making weight or after making weight? I tend to play on the Nintendo Switch a lot. Um in terms of rituals around the fight, I'm not a big rituals guy, but I tend to start my warm up for every fight. I just put my headphones in and I listen to uh, Crazy in Love by Beyonce featuring Jay Z and have a dance around. I find that starts to warm up a lot better. Oh, nice. You know, that... <laughs> a little bit daft, a bit of a dance. It's, and, uh... it's good mobility. You told me that uh, you play uh, you know, on your Nintendo Switch. Uh, what's your favorite game? Uh, favorite games of all time on this will be like Doom Eternal and Resident Evil 4 nice. they're, they're like, like the top tier games for me just in terms of where the systems work and they've just got that replayability where you can go over and over and over again especially when you're cutting weight and diet and time can go quite slow so you just pick up the switch you're pressing around doing whatever and then you put it down and three hours have gone by like that so it's pretty useful on fight week. Um, I guess that, I mean, yeah, whatever works for you. Um, what, uh, you know, you mentioned, um, you know, cutting weight. You started your career at lightweight. You move up to welterweight. Right now, you are back to 155. Were you expecting, first of all, that kind of success at 155, considering that you won the Cage Warriors Championship? And, uh, um, you know, did you consider moving up in the first uh, in the first place due to your body changing and how is it the weight cutting going nowadays? So when I was fighting a welterweight, I'm heavier now fighting a lightweight than I was at welterweight. Welterweight would be like zero weight cut at all. I remember the last time I weighed in a welterweight, the night before the weigh-in, I had spaghetti meatballs and a Ben and Jerry's ice cream sandwich, and that's the <laughs> night before the weigh-in. So I was walking oh. around at seventy-seven just had to skip breakfast and was on weight. Now I tend to walk around at 80, a little bit above 80, and then I bring it down, you know, start fight week at 78, 77. So I'm actually a bit bigger now as a lightweight than I was, than I was as a welterweight. The welterweight thing was just, I took one fight at welterweight because that was what was available. And I just had success there. I thought, yeah, you know, at that point, I wasn't all in on fighting the way I was now. I just came back to it and I thought, I just enjoy fighting. It's just step in the cage and see what happens. Um, now I'm all in on it. It was after the Madas loss, which was last fight at welterweight, where I decided, yeah, lightweight's the one to go, especially as I get higher in level. You know, that weight difference makes a bit more. But then I fought a 180 and then came back down to lightweight. And there was a moment when I returned to lightweight. I'm stood there, it's the second round, and he throws a lot of shots at my guard. And I just kind of like Dutch kickboxing guard it, like high guard take it on the gloves, move a little bit. And I just felt like, wow, this this just feels half of what I was dealing with at welterweight. Mm. And, so the, yeah, so, sorry. It's a massive and, difference coming down in weight, yeah. 
following up, were you expecting that kind of success at lightweight? Consider that uh, you, you are, you know, you belong in this weight category, weight class. Yeah, with the training that I've been doing with Harry, and I'll be, and just as soon as I felt the difference in that overall discipline, it's um. So when I was fighting at welterweight, I was disciplined in my training. Now I'm fighting at lightweight, I'm disciplined in my whole life around that, you know, nutrition and everything. And then that makes a bigger difference to performance. I'm more like a peak optimal weight, body composition and all this and that. And the performance, the speed, the endurance, everything is just so much higher. And now I'll find down at lightweight again. The shots just sink in a lot better, especially these body shots. You know, I fought a welterweight and land good shots, but it just feel like it was almost like bouncing off them. Whereas now at lightweight, these shots are sinking in and dropping people. Yeah, and we saw that in your latest fight, that body shot. Uh, since that started the sequence, uh, thanks to which you finished Kyle Driscoll in the round four back in July, it was an outstanding performance overall. Uh, you stopped your opponent. Was that the fight you imagined, though? Not, not at all. I didn't imagine the fight to go like that whatsoever. Well, I was, you know, I'd done so much training in that fight camp where I'd finish all my sparring and then just get rounds of fresh people hold me down in this position, grab onto my single leg, grab onto a double leg, grab onto a body lock, and I've just got to defend five, ten minutes. Fresh people, fresh people. All prepared from the absolute worst scenarios in terms of grappling because I knew of his wrestling credentials. And then it's pretty much just a kickboxing fight. I was like, I had it in my head. If I end up on my bum and I have to get up a hundred times, I'll get up a hundred times if that's what I need to do to win. And I didn't end up getting taken down once. It was a fully, I wasn't expecting to shrug off the takedowns that easy. I was expecting more clinch work, I was expecting more grinding. But it was a pretty much full-on kickboxing fight, apart from a few takedowns I had to defend. And then the flip side of that is I wasn't expecting to take those shots to my nose, eat those jabs and right hands. You know, I was so primed in on the takedown that he lands these shots, forced my face up a bit, that it was a completely different fight to what I expected. So it was like I predicted the fourth-round finish. I just didn't think it would be in such a kickboxing-heavy fight. How was it for you to compete in the championship rounds, even though, in fact, the the stoppage came early in round four? But, you know, just that edge to go to compete over round three. Yeah, I've always wanted to see the championship rounds. It's it's something you think of your whole career, just that difference between 15 minutes and 25 minutes. I know it only went like a minute and five or something. It was only like a minute and 10 seconds of the fourth round. Well, it was good to it was good to see it and get the finish in that round. And a big difference is I could just keep up my feints and my movement and my striking in deep into the fight like that. I remember a, an earlier thing I had in my career was I'd come out a bit fainty, come out a bit faster, and then by the second and third round, my feints have just stopped. I've not got the same level of footwork by the second and third round. But then that one, I didn't even feel like I could have felt like five more rounds could have gone by if I had to. I just felt like such a control of my pace and such a control of my rhythm that I could have just gone and gone and gone and gone. Right now, you're scheduled to take on Chris Bangart at Cage Warriors 147 on November the 20th. Where, um, I'm guessing the, the, the answer here, but where did you prepare for this fight? So, you know, this fight, it's relatively short. It's very short notice for a champion to defend his belt. I wasn't thinking about November 20th, particularly. I was just training loads. I train more out of camp than a lot of people train in camp. And I'm starting to feel like I'm peaking. I'm, I'm, my weight's coming down. I'm feeling really fast, even though I've got no fight set. And I say to my brother, Harry, should I be worried if I'm peaking and there's no fight coming up? It was literally the next day after that, uh, Ian Dean got in touch with me and put this fight forward, because Chris Bungard was supposed to be fighting Gavin Hughes on the 12th, uh, the show had just gone, and now he's fighting for the title. So he has to be grateful in that respect that the kind of champion that is a lightweight champion now, me, will put it on the line, and he has to be grateful that I'm granting him this opportunity. He has to be aware that 
also because I'm the kind of competitor that just wants to compete like that, it makes it way more dangerous for him. Who are uh, some of your sparring partners in addition to your brother? So my brother's the main one. We've got, got a really good gym of fighters, a lot of amateur fighters, people who fought pro over abroad. So I've got, uh, you know, my coach is Abdul Mohammed, and he'll still spar. He's retired, been retired many years, you know, in his 40s, and he'll still put the gloves on and spar and wrestle and throws about and give us hard rounds. His brother Faramos has fought pro in Afghanistan. We've got all these amateur guys, Leon Arms, Zanya, loads of guys to spar with. Sometimes travel and train, but I haven't traveled and trained for a bit. And I didn't really do that, to be honest. Apart from one trip to Next Generation in Liverpool, I didn't really travel and train much for the Kyle Driscoll fight. So he was training out there in AKA with all these world beating sparring partners and facility and what have you. I'm training down a little gym in a little back alley in Middlesbrough. And it's not like I brought in loads of guys, just trained correctly did the right drills, made the most of everything. Yeah, for real. And uh, you know, eventually you, you won that that fight. Um, and listen, back to your upcoming clash, what do you expect from your next opponent? I guess that you studied him a little bit. See, because I've known a Chris Bung in a while. Uh, when I fought in Bellator, there was, there was this weird mix-up where I was told I was fighting Charlie Leary. So I was watching Charlie Leary's fights. One of them was with Chris Bungard. And then it got mixed up when I got the contract. It was so, it was Nicolò Soli, which was interesting. But when I was watching Charlie Leary, I was watching one of his fights with Chris Bungard. And he just put a pace on him. Charlie Leary is a grinding fighter. And Chris Bungard just seemed to be struggling within six minutes of the fight. So at the end of one of the rounds, Charlie Leary helps him up, gives him a hand to help him up. So it can kind of seem a bit inconsistent like that. He can be flat, he can, he can get burnt out. But then sometimes he's come out and he's got really quick finishes. He's, he's dangerous on the back and he's dangerous with his jiu-jitsu. So I have to prepare for the most dangerous version of Chris Bungard, whether whatever version shows up, I'm prepared, prepared for the best. To, to be honest, though, if I've seen him flagging and seen him gassing in a five-round fight with me, that's, that's the worst recipe for him. La, the last time you predicted uh, a round four step edge, what about this time? Third round. So in my last two fights, I predicted the stoppage at the right round. I predicted the second round in March, predicted the fourth round for this. I think third round for this fight, you know, it could come quicker, but he's tough and he's got that kind of veteran savvy. They know how to survive, you know, some of these more experienced guys like you know, he's given up his back, got finished quick, and sometimes he's... But these veteran people who've been in there and got that cage time, they know how to find the spots to survive, even when they're tired, even when they're struggling, even when they've taken some damage. So I'm I'm expecting a third round. If it comes quicker, it comes quicker. But if I had to put one round, put your money on that, I'd say third. Uh, what about your walkout song? Have you already picked it? Yeah, I'm I'm set with... Heartbreaker by Pat Banatar. Since I returned to Cage Warriors, you know, I returned and fought with Dean Truman. All my fights in Cage Warriors up to winning the belt, I've entered to Heartbreaker by Pat Banatar. The reason was, a few weeks before I fought Truman, I watched that film Nobody with Bob Odenkirk. And there was a car chase with it, with the song Heartbreaker by Pat Banatar. And I thought, I like that song, I'll just nick it. And now because I've entered to it a few times, I like it. it it's... It's got almost like a power over me. If I just hear it, if I'm just sat in a car and I hear it, I get goosebumps. I get the fight feeling. So I think it's just, it's just set now. I used to enter to all kinds of game soundtracks and stuff, but it's Heartbreaker by Pat Banatar every time now. I mean, so far so good. The results are on your side, George. I finished my questions. Do you have any less messages? Uh, just tune in on. 20th of November. Thanks to me, Jim's Middle Fight Academy, Newcastle Fight Center, Unit 29 Fitness, sponsors, J Max Scaffolding, Bespoke Financial, T Side Waste Clearance Services, Canopy North East, Northeast, Market Me, Beatniks, uh, Rev Gear, all the good stuff. Thank you for giving us a little bit of your time today. Best of luck with the Rakomi fight. And hopefully, I will hear again from you in the future, man. Thank you for having me. Have a nice one. Bye bye.